It's a pleasure to introduce Deepak Sama. Um, he's a professor here of um, South Asian religions and philosophy. Um, he's been here at Case Western Reserve um, since 2004 um, and rapidly rose to um, full professor in 2012. Um, he's the author of a number of books, Classical Indian Philosophy, a reader, Hindu, um, Hinduism, a reader, Epistemologies and Limitations of Philosophical Inquiry, and an introduction to, I know, Mr. Madhva. Vedanta. Thank you. Mm -hmm. um, he's also um, been a guest curator at the Cleveland Museum of Art, and, uh, and he's a cu curatorial consultant for the Department of Asian Art at the Cleveland Museum of Art. Um, this isn't all there is. Dr. Sharma, who's also a very lively participant. Um, he posts regularly on the Huffington Post on such topics as the Grateful Dead. I did. Uh, yeah. Right. Uh, one that, that stuck out for me for some reason, yoga and pornography, the problem of definition. But I think most importantly, what makes a university great? Audacious irreverence. That's what. So he's going to talk to us today about, well, I'm going to slightly change your title because I think you're going to talk to us about decolonializing museums. And I think if you talked about that, you'd be talking about why people shouldn't attend decolonizing. That is interesting. Right. So on the ethics of deploying emikinetic excellence. Thank you. Because In this speech. connection, I perhaps I will suggest that people shouldn't attend. So, but but l let me get to that. So first, I want to thank uh, Shannon French, who's who's not here, and maybe she's you know going to see this later. So I'll way better. Um, uh, and she was unable to attend, but um, but it's really thanks to her that I began thinking about this topic at all. I find that that the, the kind of my most exciting sort of intellectual reflections are usually thrust upon me by someone else. And the, someone says, like, think about this, and you have three weeks. <laughs> and then I plunge into it. And if, I, if, it's, if, it's a, if I'm able to uh, get absorbed in it in the right way, then it's transformative for me. And so I have, without a doubt, been transformed by this, this, this study of the last, maybe only, today is what, Friday? week and a half. <laughs> so it has been lots of reading and lots of reflection and I so thoroughly enjoy it and that is why I do what I do. So let me share some of that with you. Okay, so thanks Shannon, wherever you are. <laughs> um, thank you. Um, and thank you all for attending. So um, let me read. I'll be reading a little bit and I'll be using the PowerPoint um, when necessary. Okay, and the PowerPoint, uh, you have um, um, a document there that has uh, some of the slides, but not all of them, okay? <clears throat> so in this intellectual exercise, I propose to examine in brief the colonial construction of categories in museums to differentiate and distinguish works of art. I will problematize their use in what is purportedly a post-colonial world. I will examine a map of our very own Cleveland Museum of Art. For those of you who don't know, it's just over there. <laughs> A museum that I know and love to shed light on this. And I should probably say that in no way am I representing the museum um, in this talk. <laughs> Having done so, I will then offer an emic taxonomy, namely Rasa, that derives from Bharata's Natya Shastra, a 2,000 year old dramaturgic text, as an instance of an alternative aesthetic or knowledge system. I will evaluate and arrange some objects found in the CMA according to Bharata's principles. Hello. Hi. What would a museum, museum look like if it used non-Western categories to differentiate and organize Western art? Right, what would it look like? What would it look like? How would it change? How would the design of the museum change? How would the arrangement of things change? So what would a museum look like if it used non-Western categories to differentiate and organize Western art? How would archetypal and familiar objects fare under a completely different aesthetic system? Is the placement of these familiar objects in, the, in this new scheme of classification fruitful? I want to ask you, and since it's only been a week and a half out, I'm not entirely sure myself. Fruitless or futile? <clears throat> My overall intention is to have you all 
recognize the colonial origins and implications of a familiar and humanly constructed biased categories and to question their status. I intend also to make the familiar strange and the strange familiar. My larger goal, which I believe to be the purpose of a liberal arts education, and this is really in reference to that Huffington Post piece, is to encourage recognition of and reflection on one's presuppositions, epistemic, ontological, aesthetic, and otherwise. If this intellectual exercise has that consequence, then it will have served its purpose. I acknowledge, of course, before you, um, before you start wondering this yourselves, so I'll, I'll beat you to it, that constructions like Western museums, perhaps even the word construction, <laughs> and the like, are themselves humanly constructed products. Right? So in fact, all words are. So you can imagine that I could put quotes around every word that's there and keep doing this. I won't. So just consider that, that everything is in italics. <laughs> I employ and deploy them here, these terms, which are human constructs, as a pragmatic strategic device to compel epistemic confusion. If that confuses you, then I've already succeeded. <laughs> Post-colonial perspectives. A great deal has already been written about the desire and drive to display the objects of colonized people and sometimes even the colonized or formerly colonized peoples themselves for the consumption and enjoyment of colonizers or formerly colonizers. Since some of you here, I'm looking around here, are not familiar with this pattern of interpretation, namely post-colonial, please permit me to offer an overview, to paint a post-colonial picture, as it were, with broad breaststrokes. <clears throat> You're all welcome to laugh at my funny jokes, no? Not working? Okay, good. A few people did. And you're my class, so you get an extra point at the end of the year. <laughs> I'm just kidding. Post <laughs> see that two points then. <laughs> okay. Post colonial methodologies and perspectives are bound together by a fundamental epistemological presupposition. Namely that namely that all taxonomies and their constituents are humanly constructed, and that these knowledge systems were used and continue to be used to colonize to subordinate colonized groups, and to justify subjugation, colonialism, and imperialism. It is also presupposed that since their invention and implementation, these taxonomies and categories continue to perfume, pervade, and poison their current and contemporary usages. That is, even if the times have changed, supposedly, the colonial or oppressive stench and flavor of such taxonomies remains. In this post-colonial view, terminology cannot be extricated from its historical past. <clears throat> Let me offer two examples to illustrate this. The invention, <clears throat> the invention in the 17th and 18th centuries of the classification redskin as a way to identify the indigenous people of North America whose skin pigmentation was comparably tawny in comparison to others has oppressive stereotypes, I'm sure you'll agree. The term has cruel connotations for some and evokes the history of the attempts at their extermination, as has been evidenced by the recent debates about the name and iconography of a football team, the Washington Redskins. I'm, I'm I was ashamed, embarrassed, amused to learn that I actually used to wear a Washington Redskins t you know, sweatshirt when I was growing up. I mean, no wonder the kids in my neighborhood didn't know what kind of Indian I was, right? <laughs> or in a particularly Northeast Ohio example, surely it is far from ideal to celebrate or display, <clears throat> as I'm doing right now, the mascot and logo of the Cleveland Indians, namely Chief Wahoo. Right? Or Wahoo, or something like this. I don't know. Um, <laughs> but uh, at any rate, Cleveland Indians, now it gets worse here. I'm in Cleveland Indian. It's worse here right? than just the Redskins t-shirt. Or in, okay, celebrate. In this way, the term Redskin and Chief Wahoo logo will always be colored by their past, even if used in contemporary settings. In the broadest sense, then, post-colonialism is a reading and interpretive practice oriented around hierarchies subordination and power practices and presuppositions that are essential to any post-colonial perspective. 
My desire today, then, is to shed post-colonial light on the collection and categorization of objects in museums. <clears throat> museums and Enlightenment taxonomies. It should be of no surprise that museums have been, in part, institutions and cultural endeavors whose contents and funding have emerged from colonial relationships and from the exploitation of colonized peoples. Museums have served as temples to the, collection, to the collections and treasuries of the wealthiest, as three-dimensional displays of nationalist and imperialist identities, and at their worst, a mere menagerie upon which objectified specimens of and about colonized people are displayed. And I want to say just a couple of things about these two images here. Venus Hottentot, many of you are probably familiar with this image. The image on the right is a 1937 image um, um, uh, of uh, uh, people looking at, obviously, children looking at a, a, a diamora of Native Americans. And um, uh, I think it says a great deal, just looking at 1937, I think this one was taken, this picture. <clears throat> it is not without some irony that the birth of the museum stems from an enlightenment compulsion to classify and categorize all that is believed or imagined to exist to construct and compile comprehensive encyclopedias in the hopes of contributing to, deriving, or confirming a grand narrative, grand strategy, or teleology. Of course, that grand narrative has, as its main concern and actor, the history and evolution of so-called European Western civilization. I can't resist, but consider that with quotes around it. <laughs> civilization and was, to some degree, intended to replace the dominant Christian narrative. It's the enlightenment in a paragraph. <laughs> the museum is the archetypal manifestation of these constructions, I think. When these constructions are combined with national identities and imagined communities, yet another product of colonization, the museum becomes an embodied celebration and manifestation of the aforementioned propaganda. A visit to the hallowed halls of the museum is exposure to and indoctrination to and confirmation of the greatness of the nation. The ethic then of employing an etic taxonomy, I feel I've addressed it to some degree. After all, this is, uh, I've been asked to speak about ethics. And in a, in a large sense, this intellectual exercise here can be perceived as having an immediate or expected impact for achieving social justice. So if, if we want to think about ethics here, then one can think of this as a kind of corrective, this, 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 uh, this study. OK, enough theory for now. I'm sure you would agree. Let us consider how a museum is arranged. What sorts of objects are included? How are they characterized? And which ones are grouped together? How are they organized, those that are grouped together? And most importantly, how are non-European and non-Western objects and peoples classified? <clears throat> Consider these maps. Oh, National Gallery of Art. OK. Consider, so here, I want to first look at, this is not a map, but this is a listing of, of, of the wings at the Louvre. And it, if you can't see it, which I think you probably can, it's also in your um, PowerPoint handout. So um, very interesting building, right? And surely, a kind of a product of colonization at its best, at its worst, and uh, uh, nationalism at its best and its worst, and for sure, the model of all museums in a, in, a, in a wonderful, frightening, exciting sort of way. So let's just see here, OK? We have in the Denon wing, or the Denon wing, Islamic art, OK? Oh, we you know, that's, so it's, it's an interesting parenthetical enclosure here. We've got, Islamic art, and then we have arts of Africa, Asia, Oceania, and the Americas, and they really ought to be all grouped together, don't you think? Aren't they just all the same people? I mean, really, don't you? I mean, come, of course they should be grouped together. Art, Africa, Asia, Oceania, and the Americas. <laughs> It's too bad it wasn't arts of the Orient, but at any rate. <laughs> but what, what, look, this is, wait, this is 2015. 15? What is 2015? Or is this, what, is it 15? OK. <laughs> this is not 17th century or 18th century? What is, the, what? And this is still there? 
Oh, it is still there, right? This is, this is still there. East, Medi East Mediterranean in the Roman Empire, Italian and Spanish paintings, so they're special. 19th century French paintings, oh, of course. English paintings, <clears throat> and so on. Over here, we have ancient Iran, Arabia, and Near East. The Near East? I thought Shaker was the Near East. No, I don't know. This is so interesting. Huh. And they're in different wings, but clearly this one bugs me the most. This is very interesting. This is how this museum is arranged. This is how it's arranged. There's no doubt about it. What is this arrangement? How are, how are we to understand? Anyway, very peculiar. But surely, right, things at the CMA are a little bit different, right? Surely they're. Oh, look at that. What, what is the first thing that you see here? Let me see here. One second. Now I'm going to have to do this old person thing here. Okay. So, <laughs> sorry. I'm, no, this is all complicated. So, South Gal, so people know this. How many people have been to the CMA? Right? A few people? Okay. Everybody knows where it is, right? <laughs> okay, good. So, at the CMA, right, we have the West Wing. So, what's the West Wing? 247, 246, 245? Someone? What is it? The West Wing? Not a television show. What is the West Wing? What does it say? It says Chinese, Indian, and Southeast Asian. Right? So what kind of category is that, people? I'm asking. Coherent. Co coherent, OK, perhaps. But what kind of category is that? Geographic. geographic. It's just a geographic category. Right? These are those areas. And those areas are, are their humanly constructed lines and borders that we draw around things. right? Indian, so it must be really new because India is really only what, like, you know, 60 years old? Like, it's a really new thing? Is this contemporary Indian art? Oh, it's not? Did I miss something? It's not that way? Huh. I'm so confused. Okay, and then the, and it's ironic that the East is on the West, <laughs> right? <laughs> By the way, just funny, but it's true, right? The East is on the West, so the East, I don't understand, but let me keep, I'm just looking at this, right? From the, <laughs> blinded by the post-colonial light that I'm shedding on this. <laughs> and, but on the east wing, we have contemporary. Impressionism, abstract, what kind of categories are that? What kind of, what kind of category? Impressionism, what kind of category is that? That's not geographic, is it? It's stylistic. No. It's stylistic? So one, like what? The, how did this category system come out? This is very odd. It's not consistent then. Or it's very peculiar, I think. Impressionism, abstract, so there's no contemporary Indian, but if there was Indian Impressionism, where would it be? What, I, don't, I don't know, this is terrible, what to do? I'm supposed to be a consultant for the Asian art, so this is my, con I'm confused. I'm having epistemic confusion here. Huh, neoclassical, British, American, Tiffany. What, what, what kind of category is that? Tiffany. Is there a country called Tiffany? No? There isn't. Is there a stylistic like impressionism called Tiffany? No? What is Tiffany then? What is Tiffany? Hello, Joy. <laughs> what is Tiffany? People? Specific artist. Specific artist. A name. A name. Huh. That is and some, you know, there's those things cost a lot, right? And somebody must have spent a lot of money to donate all that. <laughs> Fabergé? What's up? What's what's uh, somebody? I would only mean to egg you on. I'm sorry. No, that was good. No, that was good. It's a hot. This is a. This is very confusing. Now, if we go to level one, maybe things are better at level one. Prints and drawings, which I like that gallery there. That's where I curated. Ancient and Near Eastern. Greek and Roman. Hmm. Early Christian. Is there a late Christian someplace? Medieval. Medieval. Who's medieval? Medieval. That's a very peculiar thing. It's a, it, I'll say something about time in a minute. But, uh, oh, I didn't mean that pun, but that was good. Late medieval, northern res renaissance, French tapestries and illuminated manuscripts. Rotating textiles and manuscripts. That's interesting. Do they spin? No? Okay, good. A couple. <laughs> I'm so confused by these categories. And then Islamic. But there are no, it's, there's, it's, 
India is not, well, wait a minute here. India and Southeast Asia is not Islamic? There's no, there's no Islam in those areas? What, I'm, I'm thoroughly confused. I'm gonna have to resign my position here and there as well. At any rate, and if a museum such as the CMA strives to be comprehensive or in the history and mission statement of the CMA, quote, proud to be one of the world's most distinguished comprehensive art museums as any good encyclopedic product of the Enlightenment ought, then what can we say about the makeup and contents of the vast collection? What can we say? It's supposed to be comprehensive. It said it. I mean, I'm not making it up. It says it in the mission statement. <clears throat> Interesting kind of missionary. Should the content of the collection, I ask you, be indexed to the demographics and diversity of the world or of the immediate and local geographic region? If it is comprehensive, what does comprehensive mean? What should it reflect? Should it reflect the demographics of Cleveland, of Northeast Ohio, of the Midwest, whatever that is? We're all Midwesterners here now. The Midwest, America, the what, what, what is, should it ref, I don't, I'm so confused here. I've discussed a similar issue in an article, not surprisingly, in the Huffington Post, entitled Affirmative Action and the Critical Mass of Diversity in Religious Studies Departments. I asked, so there's a parallel here, I asked, should a Department of Religious Studies, <clears throat> whose mission is to teach students about religions, have a critical mass of faculty who teach and research minority religions that will enrich everyone's education and that will be beneficial for the nation as it maneuvers in a globalized world. Similarly, should an art museum such as the CMA or the Louvre have a critical mass of non-Western art? It's comprehensive after all, right? So what, what percentages, what proportions should it have? I mean, there are you know, lots of there are like a billion Hindus, so should one-sixth of, you see where I'm going with this? Yes, comprehensive, I said comprehensive. Did I make it up? It's in the mission statement, right? <clears throat> Alas, again, from the HuffPost piece on the academic. Of course, in the Western academe, most departments of religious studies weigh more heavily on <gasps> Christianity than on Judaism, Islam, Hinduism, Buddhism, Sikhism, Zoroastrian, or any other religion. Is this merely Christian privileging? Is it anachronistic? Is it a bad idea? Should affirmative action principles, really that's what I'm thinking about, right? Yes, no, maybe? Should affirmative action principles and practices help to form a model or ideal intellectual community and achieve a critical mass in departments of religious studies or in museums? If this is applied to the museum context, then one needs to ask if there should be an equal number of pieces displayed for each self-identifying group. <clears throat> should it reflect the proportions present on the earth? Or should it genuflect to the current hegemony? Should the metrics be reflected in the demographics of the immediate surroundings? And so on and so on. So how should space be used in the museum? And what does the space in the museum and how it's being used suggest about the dominant paradigm? And what kind of irony is there is when you say that it's comprehensive and you don't show everything there is to show? It's the same kind of hubris that we saw in the Enlightenment with the production of encyclopedias. Everything there is to be known, but here's what we know, and this is everything. <laughs> because it's what I know, it's everything, right? This is kind of what it is, right? <laughs> in any event, if it's not there, you can find it on the web. <laughs> <clears throat> Alternative taxonomies. So you may wonder, right? Or worry. Anybody wondering, right? What is the alternative? Anybody wonder? What is the alternative? Well, I'm glad you asked or wondered. <laughs> In this connection, I propose to share with you the aesthetic theory as outlined in Bharata's Natya Shastra, composed between 3000 and 3400, 3400 Sri Krishna Sambhat. I'm going to repeat that. Maybe you should write that down. <laughs> Composed between 3000 and 3400 Sri Krishna Sambhat, 
which is between about 200 BCE and 200 CE in the calendric framework of the dominant ideology. <laughs> That's good, wasn't it? <laughs> Sorry, I'm getting too pleased with myself here. Sri Krishna Sambhat is indexed to the years after the birth of the Hindu god Krishna. It's a different way of orienting oneself in time. <coughs> The Natya Shastra, regarded as a Panchaveda, that's the fifth Veda, is a dramaturgic text, a manual on Natya, the performing arts. And this includes theater, music, dance, and, by extension, chitra, paintings and images. Though the text does not directly address what appears to be static and material objects, such as the ones typically found in a museum, it proposes a comprehensive, near encyclopedic, aesthetic theory that makes this important, this text, important and germane for this discussion. <coughs> the Natya Shastra, by the way, is the product of a Sanskrit and Brahminical hegemony. So the taxonomy that I'm about to offer to you is as problematic as the ones found in the CMA and elsewhere. After all, <clears throat> it was the product of Brahmins in South Asia who imagined and sometimes implemented a dominant and hegemonic, hegemonic knowledge system of their own. <clears throat> so this is guilty of the same. I nevertheless deploy it as a counterbalance here. <clears throat> the aesthetic theory, which at its core concerns rasa, is rather complex, but in this talk, I'd like to give everyone just a taste of it. <clears throat> rasa. <clears throat> rasa has a very wide semantic range and refers most prominently as a gust and it's used uh, most prominently as a gustatory term with references to the flavor or the taste of something. <laughs> It can also refer to the essence of something. The juice of a mango can be said to be the rasa, as could the sap of a tree. As more properly a food, rasa refers to the essential taste of something. <clears throat> something that is without rasa, that is near rasa, would be bland. There is, in fact, some of you might know, a delicious South Indian soup Anybody ever have rasam? Made with the tamarind base, tomatoes, and chilies called rasam. Has anybody had rasam? Ah, then it is like that. <laughs> with the proper ingredients, any dish can evoke or manifest then rasa. In this connection, rasa, as it is used in the context of aesthetic theory, connotes the enjoyment and experience of an emotion caused by a natya, a drama. As Bharata Muni so succinctly states, vibhava, anubhava, vi, vyab, vyabhi, vyabhichari, samyogyata, <coughs> rasa, nishapatihi, which is what it says here. This should be obvious to you. <laughs> oh, this is not in English. <laughs> Ah, rasa is, a, <laughs> rasa is the combination of vibhava, anubhava, and vyabhichari bhava, the transient. I'll say more about these in a minute. But just a quick aside, okay, is that I've translated here, yes? I mean, obviously, there's a translation here. But a good question to ask about translation <coughs> and taxonomy and categories is that if, if you translate something, let's say, into English, then as I mentioned earlier in the first few comments that I made that English words, no matter how much we imagine them not, uh, to, 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 to not have a historical baggage attached to them, they will always have a historical baggage attached to them. So when you translate something from Sanskrit to English, do you ever really get the, ah, the rasa of the Sanskrit word? <laughs> right? Right? And this is a good question. How trapped are we in language? And I should point out that, that in the history of Sanskrit itself, Sanskrit is believed by many to be untranslatable. 
untranslatable, that it is not possible to really convey the, the real significance, meaning of a Sanskrit word in any other language but Sanskrit. Right? So, which is its own kind of hegemonic language establishment, without a doubt. But even in this talk, which I should have given entirely in Sanskrit, it's true, even in this, we're only getting a, a, a hint of the flavor of rasa. <laughs> no? OK. <laughs> so rasa, then, is a combination of vibhava, anubhava, and vyabhichari bhava. <clears throat> Very succinctly, uh, and we don't need to worry too much about these, the, 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 the real technical um, aspects here. <clears throat> Vibhava is the causes and determinants of the rise of an emotion. Anubhava refers to the gestures uh, expressive of what's going on in a character. Remember, this is referring to the natya, the drama, right? Like a casting a terrified glance, you know, or something like this, heaving a sigh, oh, so on and so forth. I'll say more about this. And vyabhichari bhavas are transitory emotions. Okay? But bear with me. Okay? The aesthetic theory found in the Natya Shastra thus concerns the contexts and conditions to evoke rasa, an emotional experience, in the rasika, the connoisseur. So rasa, ka is he who possesses or she who possesses. So rasika is one who possesses rasa, the rasika, the connoisseur. In a play, for example, the plot, the costume, the narrative, the stage, and the abilities of the actors, in addition to a host of other contextual factors, whether or not the person next to you is crinkling their you know, candy and so on and so forth, <clears throat> must be present for the enlightened theater goer to experience the intended or desired emotion. These are then the vibhava, anubhava, vyabhichara bhava. This is the, those kind of context things. Bear with me. These are ingredients. So think of this as ingredients, which, if proportioned properly and in the correct order and time frame, can evoke rasa. Okay, so if the context is appropriate, proper, and the actor is good, and the plot is good, then one can have that emotional moment, that rasa, that experience. So think of it really in terms of ingredients. Bharata Muni <clears throat> explains the gustatory relation in his Nati Shastra. Because it is enjoyably tasted, it is called rasa. How does the enjoyment come? Persons who eat prepared food mixed with different condiments and sauces and so on, if they are sensitive, enjoy the different tastes, and then feel pleasure or satisfaction. Likewise, sensitive spectators, after enjoying the various emotions expressed by the action, actors through words, gestures, and feelings, feel pleasure, and so on. This emotion, this rasa, which is manifested or accessed under the right conditions, I want to emphasize that, under the right conditions, will be experienced in its essential an unadulterated form by the rasika, also known as the rasa vadana, the taster of the rasa. It is experienced by the rasika if and when all of the necessary conditions are met, which includes both the context and her or his capacity. Right? Remember, this is a learned thing. It's like you have, it has to be learned. You have to learn. <clears throat> by no means is this aesthetic experience available to the masses. It is not available to the masses. Rather, it is available only to the refined uh, connoisseur who has become a virtuoso in recognizing and experiencing the intended rasa. The precise ontological status of rasa was debated and commented upon by subsequent scholars. Some commentators, for example, believe that the rasa entered the rasa vadana, the taster of the rasa, like a lightning bolt. Right? That it was like a lightning bolt, and there was like a flash immediately from the stage itself. While others used language to suggest that the connoisseur discovered the emotion internally. So there's some debate about whether this rasa comes externally, or it is something that's uncovered and found from within. And there's a long history of this. Um, uh, 
800 years of people are writing new kind of ideas and theories about what is the ontological status of rasa. Um, and some actually, um, Abhinavagupta, much later, 11th century, he suggests that that kind of that rasa moment, he, he combines with um, um, moving beyond dualities. So it becomes a mystical experience, right? And you merge with God in this kind of rasa moment, right? Very interesting. <clears throat> anyway, there's a lot to be said, but just a taste here of rasa. <clears throat> OK, taken as an aesthetic concept, rasa then <clears throat> refers to the essence or flavor of a particular emotion that a play, a dance performance, a musical performance, or even a painting or a sculpture evokes in the observer. A poorly acted play or one which had a noisy attendee would not induce or stimulate rasa. Rasa. <clears throat> According to Bharata, there are eight rasas, ashta rasa. <laughs> These are shringara, love, which I think I have in your, in, as erotic love, <clears throat> hasya, comic, karuna, compassion, raudra, furious, vira, heroic, bhayanaka, terror, bhivitsa, odious, and adbhuta, marvelous. Incidentally, two thoughts incidentally, that each of these is also associated with a color. Okay, So if you're thinking in terms of drama and performance, or the colors of a painting right, or an image, <coughs> Shringara is light green, Hasya is white, Karuna is gray, Raudra is red, Vira is a yellowish red, Bhayanaka is black, <coughs> Bibitsa is blue, and Adbhuta, marvelous, is yellow. Interesting. And just as an aside, each one of these is also associated with a god or goddess. Right? So there's a lot going on here, I think you'd agree. <clears throat> and is it in your handout? It says erotic? Right. Just as a quick aside, I put that in there, erotic. And then I came across, I did some interesting reading, and someone pointed out that, that Sringara is often translated as erotic, and that began with Victorian Sanskritists who were trying to m point out something bad about Indian aesthetic theory, that it was all filled with sex and eroticism and so on. So I accidentally put it on this one and then corrected it, as you can see here. But just that mistake is an interesting kind of colonial category hangover, <laughs> so, so to speak. Right. At any rate. So these are the eight rasas. Okay? I will not list or address the other components, ingredients. Well, each one of those uh, other ingredients that I message, uh, mentioned, Anubhava and so on, each have you know, 8, 30, and so on and so forth. And you can rest assured right, that, the, that broadly speaking, um, um, uh, reflection in this way in uh, the South Asian world involved lots of lists. Um, so uh, the people who produce these texts are notorious for being um, what's called uh, um, uh, uh, matrikas, that they're list makers. So they make lists of lists of lists. What do you really mean by Shringara? And then there's five different kinds of Shringara. And how is that really suggested? And so on and so on and so forth. And uh, there are lots and lots of variants. So I'll just give you, these are the basic eight. right? This is the simple eight, you could say. <clears throat> So I think it will distract us too much if I, if I give you too many sub-details. But still said, that uh, broadly speaking, these di distinctions then concern subtle and minute actions or events that might contribute to the rise of rasa. For example, let me give you one example of these subdivisions with Sringara. Okay? Sringara rasa requires rati, love, revealed by attractive clothing, beautiful surroundings, loving looks. <coughs> side glances, and involuntary but attractive gestures. <laughs> Great art in this context, then, is a painting or sculpture. Let me repeat this one. Great art in this context is a painting or sculpture that evokes one of the eight intended emotions, rasa, in the refined connoisseur, rasika. I have changed what great art is, right? Right? So if we use this word art in this kind of emic sense of rasa, then it should be something that impels or initiates or evokes rasa in the rasika. That 
is great art. That was dramatic. <laughs> so that was Raudra, terror, right? No, furious. <laughs> anyway, <laughs> let's apply these, this rudimentary taxonomy to some of the images that are found in the CMA. Let's see what happens. What then would the CMA look like if it was arranged according to this octet of rasas? How would the lighting, you might ask, the surroundings and other paraphernalia change in order to initiate the experience of rasa by the rasika? And for those of you who are wondering, there was one time, not at the CMA, but there was one curator in 1986, B.N. Goswami, both in Paris and in San Francisco, did, he, he, he had an exhibit called, beautifully titled, The Essence of Indian Art, right? Wonderful title, right? The Essence of Indian, you get it now, right? And it was based on these eight rasas. And he had paintings and images associated with each one of those rasas. It was brilliant. What would it be like to do that here? It would be so cool. Okay. Oh, sorry. Um, anyway, so what would it look like? So let's look at some images and let the strange become more familiar and the familiar perhaps become more strange. So uh, this is audience participation. So you should, you should tell me what you think. Uh, OK. So, this image here, what, what, what is this image? People know what this image is? Monet, Monet right? I, I, you know, I'm a Monet kind of a fan, don't worry. But what, what, what rasa does that evoke? You have a list of eight, what do you think? And, 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 and if it doesn't evoke anything, <laughs> all right, may I say, if it doesn't evoke any of these rasas, Joy, then it's not great art. <laughs> no, way. how could that be? This is the greatest art in the history of, the, of whose history? It's more certainly marvelous. It is, I, that's, that's, but see, the, here's, you're right, it's Adbuta, no doubt, right? I, I think I agree with you on that, right? But now think about how many things are just gonna fit into that category and nothing else. <clears throat> is that fair? Ah, don't answer that question. But is that fair? Don't answer that question. Just think about it. Yes? Good question? It's common. <clears throat> so then there should be a room for Hasya and Adbuta. <laughs> How about this? How would you create the context to elicit this rasa? Well, who's, whose is this, obviously? Someone? Uh, hello, Vincent. Yes. And Vincent was sound of my, no, he was, this was produced when he was, Rasika. right, he was a Rasika. He was going crazy in disturbed. How would you create the context to ex have the Rasa that he intended here? Can you imagine? It would be one room, perhaps, right? Painted in very awkward ways, with <laughs> right? How what would it what would it take to create that? And what is the rasa? Is it adbuta, or is it what is it, or is it terror? Yeah, yeah, fury, fury, right? Fury or terror? Should there be a room, the terror gallery at the CMA? Right? And could you Several have? Rafa in there. Right. You know, what and and what what? Could, would this have to, if this was next to something else, then that would ruin the context. You couldn't create that terror. It would have to stand by itself. Would it not? With perhaps paraphernalia to inspire terror. Yes? Maybe um, a strobe light or something like that, right? To in kind of create the, anyway, you see my point. How about this one? Anyone know who this, who this is? I mean, not who this is an image of, but who, is the, who, who sculpted this? Rodin. Exactly. What would this be? And, and if, I, if, I just, if we can just apply this blunt instrument of rasa, right? which one would it fit into? And if it doesn't fit into any, then why is anyone owning this piece? <coughs> it's worth nothing all of a sudden. <coughs> Right, melt it down in, you know, sort of thing. Yes? Heavy? <clears throat> I mean, it would be heavy, it's true. <laughs> How about this one? 
This one you should all be familiar with. Right? I, I feel quite blue when I see this one. <laughs> Which would this be? But surely, right, it should, of course, stand alone. Like, what else could you have with it there? It but it doesn't fit. Almost all museums. Indeed, you know, that's my point. You know the works right. that you're right. But that's, that's my point. So my question then is, is, if it fits in lots of different categories, which room would you put it in? Or do you do something blunt, or you do like a blunt instrument, and you put the Islamic art downstairs, and then you put some Hindu stolen temple images that are broken upstairs in the west wing. <laughs> How about this one? That one perhaps is wonder. Perhaps. Or some of you might be frightened. <laughs> right? <laughs> Someone has allergies, they look at this and they think, no, who knows? And then the piles of art like this, where could you possibly place this? This doesn't fit into any of those categories. It simply doesn't. You could say adbuta, wonder, but you know, now it's becoming vacuous because it fills too many things. It doesn't pick out anything in particular. Ha hasya. <clears throat> this of course is the Warhol. So now I hope the familiar has become a little bit strange. But let's make the strange familiar. Ah, who is this? Ganesh. This is Ganesh. What, which rasa is being evoked here? Probably comic. That's right. Probably comic. This one? Anyone know who this one is? This is Krishna. Krishna Govardhana. Ah, very beautiful image. What should this evoke? What's that? Vira? Vira? It could be some Vira, yes. But for sure, right, if I may, that, that actually understanding the rasa of this image requires you to, to know the story of Krishna and Indra and Mount Govardhana, which only a couple of you here probably know. I, I think you know it. I'd ask you to tell it, but I'm not going to put you on the spot. <laughs> right? But there's a story about Krishna, Mount Govardhana. He lifts the mountain up to protect his village from the anger of Indra, who is a Vedic god. There's a, whole lot of, there's a whole lot of context that is expected of the, I mean, knowledge of the context that's expected of a Rasika when she or he looks at this image. And other than Nisha here, did, uh, do you know the story of Krishna Govarda? Okay, so there's two people, you know the story of Krishna Govarda? Three people who know that. The vast majority of people who see this image in the museum experience it very differently than it was intended to be experienced. <clears throat> I had a student who asked me uh, uh, in the last week, why all, like, didn't the Hindu artists, they must not have liked their image because they're all broken. And I thought, oh my gosh, this, this person is so confused about what art is, Indian art, Hindu art, how it got here. It was so sad. Um, how about this one? What is this one? This is a product of, anyone guess? What's that? Colonial India, right, for the sake of the British, because after all, the British need some encyclopedic representation of what those people look like so they can bring those images back home and show them to their friends in, I don't know, Piccadilly Circus. <laughs> right? But this is a very different kind of image that wasn't intended to instill any rasa, really, but really is a product, is, is ironically, uh, everything that I said was wrong with the museum or the colonial history of the museum. How about this one here? This one is? Anyone? Krishna and Radha. Krishna and Radha. And Krishna and Radha here. So what 
emotion is being evoked here. This one's easy. Shringara, that's right. This is Shringara. This is a Kaligat uh, image. But how much would be lost when someone observes this and doesn't recognize that it's to evoke Shringara rasa? Hopefully, this is becoming then more familiar just in this brief conversation. How about this one? This one obviously is somewhat of Shringara. This is goddess Kali in kind of erotic um, coitus with Shiva. For sure, somebody looking at this from a Victorian perspective would call this erotic, right, rather than Shringara, which is really what it is. <clears throat> this one here is a very sad but beautiful image. Right? So this one is, who is this? Hanuman. Hanuman. And Hanuman it no longer resides in the CMA. I'm so torn about that. And this should evoke, what should this evoke? There's one rasa that we're not mentioning, but that's not quite, that's a subdivision of a rasa. Shanta, that would be the ninth one. Um, and in, in a subset of all these or combinations would be bhakti, right? Devotion, right? So this is Hanuman, the monkey god from the Ramayana. And he is shown here posed in utter devotion to Rama. Now, just a quick aside reflection about this image is that this image was, was uh, in the CMA until this summer. And it was removed and returned to Cambodia, which is where it was born. And um, it was returned to its original context, I think, or at least sort of its original context, with people who are likely to observe it knowing the story of Hanuman. And in a sense, this image then, in that context, right, in theory, because in practice, who knows how it's going to turn out, it's true. But in theory, that image, this image, there, will do what it was intended to do. Whereas here, where it resided in the west side of the CMA, it did something, but certainly not what it was intended to do. What was it intended to do? Intended to evoke a rasa. Which rasa? Bhakti, Shanti, so on and so forth. Ah, this is the last image that I want to share with you. <clears throat> and then I'll tell you a little bit about it, and then I'll open it up for a conversation if there's time. I don't know what time it is, but if there's time. Oh, jeez. <laughs> Sorry. So this is a, an image, a 19th century um, a Kali Ghat painting uh, from Bengal. And uh, this was in the exhibition that I curated. Um, and these images, these Kali Ghat watercolors, were produced in, in great quantities, largely for, uh, as souvenirs for tourists, okay? for both British tourists and Indian tourists who were coming and wanted to obtain one of these images and take it back to their house and so on. And these Kali Ghat artisans, um, uh, were, were provided very cheap paper, ironically, um, that were produced uh, at a nearby Bible press, ironically. <laughs> and that's where they got the really super cheap paper to make these mass-produce, these images. These are mass-produced. Um, and this image, uh, and, and I should point out that, 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 that 19th century Bengal had scores of Indians who were employed by the British and were appropriating and taking on British sensibilities uh, and were becoming westernized, you could say, the babus, babus. And they were notorious for wearing half Indian, half British kinds of clothing. <clears throat> so I want to point out to you that, that whoever this is, I'll tell you who it is in a minute, is wearing uh, buckled shoes, right? You see the buckled shoes there, right? Can you see? I just, oh. Before you said it, I raised up. That's why I laughed. That's awesome. Oh, you see these buckled shoes, OK? So this is the goddess uh, Durga killing the demon Mahisha, 
Okay? And uh, it's a kind of classic story in the history of Hinduism. Um, when I curated, and now it seems like an appropriate, really appropriate sort of way to close this conversation, um, is that, that I, I thought that this particular image presenting the demon with buckled shoes was suggesting something about Indian independence. And that, in fact, that the, the Durga here is killing off this demon who is, in fact, the, the British. Right? So this I saw as a kind of a post-colonial, well, in those days it wasn't really post-colonial, but a kind of subversive, subaltern, post-colonial or anti-colonial response to British colonization. Um, this image here evokes lots of rasas then, in a way. <laughs> um, and I thought I would close my conversation here, looking at this and thinking about this image. What to do with the museum? What to do with these categories? How does one create the context within which the, the, the rasika will get rasa from looking at these South Asian images? If, as I've suggested, and as Bharat Muni has suggested, context is so important, then none of these Indian images, except for maybe this one, because it is a souvenir after all, but none of the images that we saw previously should actually be here. They should be in the place where they were born, or where their, the image of the, the deity is worshipped, and so on, for, their to, for them to create the, the necessary rasa. But we could say the same thing about the Van Gogh that we saw, and certainly the Monet is that when it's surrounded and busy in the way that you just described, that it's surrounded by so many different things, that it's not having uh, the desired impact or effect that the artist, uh, uh, that art, the, the, the intended by the artist. Um, so I wonder then, um, uh, and I say this only as a provocative idea, so all kinds of complicated things could come out of the next sentence, is that I really do wonder if the CMA should exist at all. Um, I'm reluctant to say that, and I certainly do not suggest anything like the poor Rodin and the friend. So, you know, don't take my thoughts out of context. Okay, it's very important to say that. But uh, I wonder if, if the only way to decolonialize the museum is to decolonize the museum and deconstruct the museum and take it apart and send everything back to where it belongs. So. Those are some thoughts. If you are filled with epistemic confusion, then I have succeeded. Thank you very much for your time. I'm so Thank appreciative. You. Thank you. So I don't know what time it is. I've probably all gone over, and you all have class to go to. Is it really? Wow. What to do? What time is it? No time for question and answer. Uh, I'm sorry that I went on so long, but I have so much to say. <laughs> Anyway, well, what you are calling for is literally the de-westernization of Western culture right. because the museum is the West. I know. It's, it's, it's the very definition. Right. Of it's complicated. And then you throw in the word comprehensive. I mean, so what should the museum do? Right? WWW. What should the museum do? It should take out the word comprehensive, perhaps. Right? Right. And, and by way of corrective, right, what would it be like if, if there were, as just as an experiment, right? If either there was an ex exhibit like the essence of Indian art that, we, that I mentioned, but along, like, along with that would be to take familiar and use rasa and put some of those pieces in that exhibit. Put the Monet, not the Monet, it's too big, but put some of the other pieces in that exhibit and see how it fared. Right? I wonder what that would do. I'm filled with adbuta. <laughs> anyway, thank you so much for your, 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 I appreciate it. Thank you. So cheers. <laughs>